Solar 101, a beginner's guide to understanding solar 2022 edition. Thinking about going solar and feel overwhelmed? Do not stress. I've made this three-part Solar 101 beginner's guide to get you up to speed ASAP. Part one, understanding solar, this video goes through the basic principles of residential solar energy. Part two, buying solar, covers the things that you should know when comparing solar quotes and preparing to buy a solar system. Part three, owning solar, explains what to do after buying solar to get the most from your system. It also goes through what you should do to prepare for electric cars and home batteries. I've put the links to part two and part three in the video description below. Now, if understanding solar is not a priority for you, I get it. Not everyone wants to nerd out like I do. Use the links to skip to part two of this guide for practical advice on buying solar. But if you recognize that understanding the basics of solar will give you an edge when buying a system, keep watching. I promise you'll find it useful. Point one, how do solar panels actually work? Electricity can be thought of as electrons flowing in a circuit, but how does sunshine make those electrons move? Well, electrons surround silicon atoms in a solar PV cell. Sunlight shining on the cells causes the electrons to eject from their positions. This leaves behind an electron hole. When a different electron finds this hole and combines with it, energy is created. The electron moves and we capture this as electricity. Nerds like me know this phenomenon as the PV effect, where PV stands for photovoltaic. A solar cell is a black or blue coaster-sized silicon wafer. The faint horizontal lines are metal fingers that collect moving electrons. They then deliver them to the thicker vertical metal lines called bus bars. The bus bars collect all the electrons and connect to the next solar cell. A residential solar panel has around 60 cells that are roughly six watts each, arranged in a six by 10 matrix. Each cell produces about 0.6 volts and 10 amps in full sun. The cells are electrically connected in series. So if one cell becomes shaded, it restricts the current to every other cell in that string. That's why you need to keep panels clean. These days, most panels come in a half cut configuration where the cells are obviously cut in half. The peak power of the most commonly installed solar panel these days is 60 times 6.16 watts is 370 watts. If you connect 18 of these panels together, you have enough for a 6.6 kilowatt solar system. 18 times 370 watts equals 6,600 watts equals 6.6 .6 kilowatts. A 6.6 .6 kilowatt system is the most commonly installed size in Australia right now. This is because it's usually the most a single phase home can put on without needing export limiting. But you need more than solar panels for a functioning solar system. That brings us to point two, the anatomy of a solar system. Here's a diagram showing the core components of a solar system. Let's go through each one in a bit more detail. Number one, the solar photovoltaic or PV panels. Solar panels absorb sunlight and generate direct current DC electricity. They do this by using the PV effect that I've just described. Number two, the rooftop DC isolator. This is a switch that can disconnect the panels from the inverter. From November 2021, thank God, the rooftop isolator is now optional if some extra precautions are taken with the wiring inside your roof. This is great news because mandatory rooftop DC isolators have caused more reliability issues than anything else, mostly due to water ingress on your roof. Number three, the inverter DC isolator. Again, this is a switch that can disconnect the panels from the inverter, but it's at ground level next to the inverter. It's useful if an electrician needs to work on the inverter or de-energize the system for any other reason. Good modern inverters now come with a built-in DC isolator, which is a lot neater and presents less risk of bad connections or water ingress. Number four, your solar inverter. This device takes the raw DC electricity from the panels and spits out 230 volts AC electricity. That's the form that your home can actually use. Number five, the AC isolator. This switch can disconnect the 230 volts AC from the inverter, de-energizing and isolating the inverter from the mains. If you need to switch off your solar system, you should always turn off the AC isolator first. And a fun fact, if your inverter is within three meters of your switchboard, you don't need an AC isolator. This is because 
you can isolate the inverter through its switchboard circuit breaker. Number six, the switchboard. The switchboard contains the breakers for every circuit in the house. It is where the grid and your solar inverter connect into your home. Your installer will need to add a circuit breaker for the inverter in the switchboard. Ideally, they'll add a consumption monitor as well. If your switchboard is small or old, installing a solar power system may also require a new switchboard. This adds approximately $1,200 or more in costs. Number seven, the consumption monitor. These are actually optional, but I highly recommend them. Solar inverters out of the box only have production monitoring. This shows you how much electricity your system has generated on a given day, hour by hour, or minute by minute. A consumption monitor is a small box of electronics that goes in your switchboard. It gives you, wait for it, full consumption monitoring. This means you'll be able to see not only what your solar system has generated, but what your home has used as well. Trust me, you want one of these, so you can understand how well your system is working. It also makes it easy to maximize your savings from solar energy by making you aware of your electricity use habits. In part two of this Solar 101 video series, I go into way more detail on exactly why consumption monitors are worth every dollar. Number eight, the grid meter. Your energy retailer, that's AGL, Origin, whoever, installs this after you get solar installed. It tells them how much grid electricity your home imports and how much solar energy you export, so they can bill you and credit you in the case of exports. Most electricity retailers will give you a login to see this data every half hour or so. Now, this smart meter is not a replacement for the consumption monitor I just described. This is because these meters can't talk to your solar inverter, meaning they don't know how much solar energy is being used inside your home, only how much surplus is going out to the grid. On a solar home, this meter is rarely only useful to the electricity retailer so they can bill you. It does not help you understand how much solar energy you are using and when you use it. Only a consumption meter can tell you that. Your electricity retailer handles your meter replacement for you if you install solar panels. Point three, the difference between power, kilowatts, and energy, kilowatt hours. It amazes me how often people in the industry who should know better mix these two up, but it's not surprising. Many others don't realize that power and energy are two different things. First up, power, measured in kilowatts. If you think of electrical current as electrons in a wire, its power is kind of how fast those electrons are flowing. Power is how fast electricity is being generated or consumed. Its fundamental units are joules per second. The size of a solar system equals its peak power output in kilowatts. For example, a 6.6 .6 kilowatt solar system might consist of 18 370 watt solar panels on the roof. This array can push electricity out at a maximum rate of 6.6 .6 kilowatts or 6,600 watts. So that's power, now on to energy. The abbreviation you'll have seen, KWH, stands for kilowatt hour. A kilowatt hour is a measure of energy, not power. Energy is how much electricity is generated, stored, or consumed over time. For example, my solar power system produced 16 kilowatt hours of electricity today. My heater consumed four kilowatt hours of electricity today. This battery stores 13 kilowatt hours of energy. To use an example, if your solar panels generate five kilowatts for a whole hour, you will have produced five kilowatt hours of energy. That energy could be used by your appliances, exported to the grid, or stored in a battery. This simple animation demonstrates the concept. This meter has one kilowatt of power constantly moving through it from the grid. Every hour, it records one kilowatt hour of energy consumed. I mentioned earlier that the most popular solar system size at the time of filming is 6.6 .6 kilowatts. How much power will one of these systems produce? If you said 6.6 .6 kilowatts, you'd be wrong. Let me explain. 6.6 kilowatt solar systems almost always use a five kilowatt inverter. That means you'll never get more than five kilowatts out of the system at any point in time. You'll only produce your peak power around midday on a perfect solar day, which is a day that is sunny, but not too hot, as hot panels are actually less efficient. Here's an example taken from a friend's Solar Edge monitoring app. It shows the production on a perfect solar day from 6.6 .6 kilowatts of panels and a five kilowatt inverter you can see the inverter only hits its peak 
five kilowatts power output right around midday. Even if this system had a 6.6 .6 kilowatt inverter to match the panel's capacity, the peak of the curve would probably never hit 6.6 .6 kilowatts. It would probably top out around 5.3 kilowatts on that perfect solar day. That's due to dirt and dust on the panels, power tolerance of the panels, wiring losses, and inverter efficiency. The combination of all these means that the typical solar system's peak power will only be around 80% or so of the nameplate panel capacity. So do not stress if your system isn't always hitting its theoretical max power output. That is totally normal. Point four, how much energy will a solar system produce? Here's the short answer. The average amount of energy produced by a 6.6 .6 kilowatt system in Australia in one day is about 26 kilowatt hours. More in summer, less in winter. Longer answer. To guesstimate the amount of energy produced by a solar power system on an average day in Australia, simply multiply the peak power of the system, aka the system size, by the magic number, four. So, a five kilowatt system will produce five times four, about 20 kilowatt hours on an average day. A 10 kilowatt system, about 40 kilowatt hours on an average day. This magic number is higher in sunnier spots like Cairns and lower in less sunny places, such as Hobart. Remember, you'll get less on a winter's day and more on a summer's day. I hope that's obvious. The difference will depend on how pronounced the seasons are where you live. Compare the summer and winter outputs of Sydney versus Hobart. The eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that in February and December, a solar system in Hobart will actually generate more energy than one in Sydney. This is mainly due to the lower overall summer temperatures in Hobart. Remember, solar panels actually perform better when they're cooler. Point five, how solar saves you money. Solar saves you money in two ways, yeah! Number one, self-consumption. When your home is using solar energy instead of the grid, you save the cost of buying that electricity. And number two, the feed-in tariff. When you generate more energy than your home can use, you export that excess to the grid. Your energy retailer pays you a feed-in tariff for this energy. So, self-consumption plus feed-in tariff equals solar savings. But an important note, your self-consumption is actually invisible on your electricity bill. That's because your electricity retailer's dumb smart meter can't see how much solar energy has been used in your home. This leads to an all too common situation where someone will email me. Hey Finn, I just got my first post solar bill and it's showing that the system only saved me 150 bucks. This sucks. This person is confused because the only solar related line item on their bill is the feed-in tariff credit of 150 bucks. There is no line item explaining that their bill would have been $250 higher if their solar generation hadn't offset their home electricity usage. Consumption monitoring, which I talked about previously, provides this invisible piece of the puzzle. And that's why I recommend it. So you can figure out your true savings from solar power. It's the only way to do it. And finally, point six, batteries and solar. A big enough solar system is capable of giving most people a tiny zero or even negative bill. But on its own, it has two major shortcomings. First, it doesn't provide any energy at night. Secondly, if the grid goes down, your system switches off and that's a safety measure. Batteries can solve this by storing excess solar for use overnight and backing up circuits in your home in the event of a grid blackout. Some batteries don't provide backup at all. The gold standard is what I call apocalypse-proof backup, where solar will charge your batteries even in a blackout. Storing excess solar and blackout protection are really nice features to have, but batteries cost money and a lot of it. But will they save you money? I talk about this much more in part two of the Solar 101 guide, but the reality is that in 2022, battery storage most of the time simply does not pay for itself. Some people have asked me if a virtual power plant or VPP is the answer to battery affordability. Mm, I'm yet to be convinced that the savings promised by these VPPs make them worth it. Although there are a few that on paper at least get pretty close. But if your main game is saving money overall, don't worry about batteries yet, unless you have a pressing need for backup or you're severely export limited. 
you can easily retrofit batteries to any existing solar system at a later date. So there you have it, part one of my three-part Solar 101 guide. The next video in this series, part two, covers everything you need to know when seeking and comparing quotes for solar. I'm Finn Peacock, a chartered electrical engineer and the founder of solarquotes.com.au. Since 2009, it's been my mission to make solar easy to understand to the average homeowner and help them get quotes from quality solar installers that I've personally pre-vetted. If you're considering installing solar or batteries for your home or business, just visit solarquotes.com.au, pop your postcode into the top right box, fill in the form, and I'll take it from there. See you in part two.